Good morning. Greetings to you. <laughs> Greetings to you in the name of the Lord. It's wonderful to see you all here this morning uh, on this Epiphany Sunday. Epiphany uh, is actually a fixed day in the church calendar, it always takes place on January 6th. But uh, this, this year, well, every year, that it doesn't happen on a Sunday. Uh, we observe it on the Sunday closest to January 6th. So that is today. We're glad to see you. Uh, glad to see, or glad to know that there are folks who are uh, watching via the internet. We're glad to have you with us as well and hope that we will see you live and in person before very long. If you would, please fill out the attendance register and pass that along. Uh, while you're doing that, a few things to mention. Uh, one is uh, to let you know that uh, we did indeed uh, marry off Katie Kirk yesterday uh, to Zach Dudley, and uh, they are, uh, I believe, honeymooning in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee today. Um, uh, all, all went well. I, uh, I will tell you, since since he's not here and can't say anything that um, uh, after when, when I said uh, who gives this woman to be married to this man uh, Mark said her mother and I 
and then turned to Zach and said, she's all yours. <laughs> so, you know, it, it wouldn't be a public occasion without, without Mark uh, yucking it up. So, so uh, that went, went, went real well. And um, uh, if you would, please be praying for them as they start their new life together. Uh, want to also uh, mention a couple things happening this week. The deacons meet on Tuesday at 6.30. That will be their first meeting of the year. And uh, among other things, that means they will be greeting two new members whom we will be, uh, one of whom will be ordaining, both of whom we will be installing uh, this morning. And that is Ann York and Liz Stout. That will be coming up in a few moments. Then Wednesday uh, at one, the Women's Association uh, has their first meeting for the new year. And that as always will be in the library and is open to all of the women of the church. Uh, one final thing, and that is next Saturday, um, the, um, uh, the deacons will be uh, undecorating or de-decorating the church. Uh, the Christmas tree in particular was, was left up uh, at Katie's request. So this is Epiphany Sunday. It's perfectly uh, appropriate for that to still be there. But we will be bringing it down next, Thursday, uh, next Saturday at 9. And if you're available, the deacons always appreciate any help that you can give with that. I also should mention that there is no choir practice uh, this month, okay, so no choir practice today uh, or for the next three Sundays. So um, if you're looking for the choir, you won't find them. They will be gone. All right, I think that's, I think that's all. So let's worship the Lord.
Good morning. Please stand and join me for the call to worship. The call to worship this morning is from Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have come here today, God, to sing songs of praise with joy in our hearts. God, we invite you here today that we may worship you in spirit and truth. That, Father, that we may hear your word, that it may penetrate to bone and to marrow. That, God, that it may change us into the image of your son. God, grant us that today, that as we've gathered, Father, may we worship you with our whole heart. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. Please join with me as we sing our opening hymn this morning. And as a reminder, we'll be singing verses 1, 2, 5, and 6 if you're going along in the hymnal. And it's hymn number 108, the first Noel, the angel did say. The first Noel, the angel did say.
like to ask Anne and Liz if you would come forth to hear your sentence. <laughs> no. Um, uh, today, uh, Liz is being ordained as a deacon as well as installed. Uh, Anne has served previously as a deacon, so she will be installed. Uh, in addition, we also have uh, Luke Lyrela and Robert Du Bois, who are continuing as deacons into a second term. So just like you don't go up to a light bulb and unscrew it and put it back in in order to turn it on, we don't need to install them again. They're, they're already in place. Uh, and uh, there are no elders this year who are uh, being, being uh, installed. However, there is one elder who is departing or on the first of the year departed from the session. And uh, after six years, that is John Huey. And uh, I personally uh, want to thank him for his service. He has been on the session the entire time that we've been here, and uh, his his uh, his wisdom has been invaluable. We appreciate very much, uh, John, what you've done in that capacity. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And I'll warn you, you better hide next year. Uh, okay, Liz, I have for you a number of questions. Do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior? Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God? Totally trustworthy, fully inspired by the Holy Spirit, the supreme, final, and only infallible rule of faith and practice. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the Westminster Confession of Faith and the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? Do you promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with the system of doctrine as taught in the Scriptures and as contained in the Westminster Confession of Faith and the catechisms of this church, you will, on your own initiative, make known to uh, the session the change that has taken place in your views since the assumption of your ordination vows? Do you affirm and adopt the essentials of our faith without exception? Do you subscribe to the government and discipline of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church? Do you promise subjection to your uh, fellow deacons as well as the uh, elders of the session? Have you been induced, as far as you know your own heart, to seek the office of the diaconate from love, uh, from love to God and a sincere desire to promote his glory in the gospel of his son? Do you promise to be zealous and faithful in promoting the truths of the gospel and the purity and peace of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may rise unto you on that account? And now these questions are for both of you. Um, will you seek to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of, whoa, uh, let's, sorry. This is what you get for using electronics. All right. Uh, um, you all just talk among yourselves for a moment. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, will you seek to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all of your duties as a Christian and as a deacon? whether personal or interpersonal, private or public, and to endeavor by the grace of God 
to adorn the profession of the gospel in your manner of life and to walk with exemplary piety before the congregation of which God is making you a servant deacon, will you? Are you now willing to accept the call of this church as deacon and relying upon God for strength promise to discharge to it the duties required of that office? And three questions for each of you. Are you, the members of this congregation, ready to receive Anne and Liz as your deacons? Yes. Do you promise to submit to the two of them in matters of spiritual discipline and to receive with humility and love the word of truth? Do you? Do you promise to support Anne and Liz with your prayers to give encouragement and assistance in every way as they seek to instruct you in the things of the Lord and to lead you in the building of the kingdom of God in this place? Liz, I'm going to just stand next to you. And let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that Liz and Anne together have, have heard this call, have responded in the affirmative, and are now willing to take on both the burden and the joy that you have given to the two of them. We thank you for their servants' hearts. We thank you for their servants' ministries. And as they assume their office, we pray that you would send the power of your Holy Spirit upon them, that together uh, with the rest of our deacons, with the elders and with the entire congregation, all that they say and do and are, may lift high your son and bless his holy name in which we pray. Amen. Now Liz, by the authority of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church and the session and congregation of this congregation, I declare that you have been ordained to the office of deacon and that you have been duly and properly installed as a deacon of First EPC in accordance with the word of God and the laws of this church. As such, Liz is entitled to be given support, encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I present your two newest deacons for the term of 2021 to 2023, Liz Stout and Anne York. Hmm? And they and Anne said they'll see you all Saturday. <laughs> yes, nothing like taking the bull by the horns. Absolutely. You all may be seated. Thank you very much. Their term of office is three years. Uh, tw I said 2021, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. Um, You'll pardon me, my biological clock is running slow, uh, as is my brain. Yeah, thank you. Um, 2023 through 2025, yes. I said that, and when I said it, it didn't sound right, but I couldn't think of what else it might be. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Listen, I'm still writing 19 on my checks before I have to scratch it out. So 
That's how backward I am. Let's pray. Most holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. In your great mercy to us, you chose to manifest yourself to the peoples of the earth in the person of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God. We thank you for revealing yourself to us, for shining your light in a darkened world. As we remember the wise men whom you led by the light of a star to seek out your son and publicly declare to the world their worship of him, enable us to do the same and in the process to be channels of your light to all those you've placed in our lives. By the light of Christ that shines within each of your people, we come to you today in intercession for the world, for the church, and for those in need. We lift up a world that's broken, that has rejected you, and that is in desperate need of your healing love and grace. We pray for those who are bringing the message of that love and grace given in Christ to every creature, for those who bring the good news to those whom the world considers worthless or hopeless or beyond redemption, and especially for those of the EPC World Outreach Division who minister in the Muslim world. We pray too for our part in that mission, asking that your Holy Spirit's power would be poured out on us today and in the weeks and months ahead as we seek to reach our world and our community here in Anna, throughout Southern Illinois and to the ends of the earth. We pray as well for those throughout the world who are persecuted for their faith, whether it be Iraq or Syria, Turkey or China, Pakistan or Laos, Cuba or North Korea. Gracious God, wherever your people are suffering for their faith in you, we ask that you would send your spirit's power upon them, that they may be encouraged, empowered and emboldened to speak and live your truth. Show us, too, the cost of discipleship that you've called us to pay, that we in solidarity with our persecuted brethren may show forth your glory amid the trials of faithful living. We pray for those who are hurting, for those who need your healing hand to be at work in their bodies and their spirits, especially Jennifer Aspen, and Anita Harris, for those who are grieving, for those who are coping with the stresses of unemployment or financial problems. We pray for those dealing with difficult family situations that you would give them wisdom and patience to cope with stress and frustration. We pray in these as well as the situations unknown to us that you would do your work of healing, of consolation, of encouragement, and of provision, that you would use us as you will to be your hands and feet and the speakers of grace, mercy, and love that you desire us to be. Loving God, all this along with the unspoken concerns of our hearts do we lay before you, sure of answers to come in your own time and way. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, even as we pray together with one heart and voice as he has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We give thanks to the Lord for the ministry that he's given us and we have an opportunity to express that gratitude 
to the presentation of our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the ways that you've blessed us, for the resources that you've placed in our hands, resources of time as well as finances, goods, and talents. We thank you for all of it. And as we give back a portion of what you've entrusted us with, we ask your blessing upon these gifts and upon those who give them, asking that you would use them to extend your kingdom in this place and to the ends of the earth. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. How great is our God. Uh, Brother David, I, I didn't bring my electronic device. I bought the book in case mine failed. At least I, I, I've got my book here. Oh, uh, we stop making mistakes when we stop trying, don't we? Amen. Uh, from God's word here. Arise, shine, for your light has come. 
and glory of the Lord rises upon you. Seek darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes, look about you, all assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth of the seas will be brought to you. To you, the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will come, will cover your land. Young camels, a median, an ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bring gold and incense and proclaim the praise of the Lord. Please stand as you're able and join me in our second hymn this morning, which is the insert in your bulletin, We Three Kings. <laughs> See you. 
reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. So, For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I found myself pondering a deep scientific question this week. No joke. It's in the field particularly of biology. And that question was why or if light is integral to life. Uh, You remember in the Gospel of John, in his prologue, he speaks of the word as being light, and he says that light was the life of men. Well, is light and our light and life really connected? And as I looked into it, uh, in very layman's terms, the answer is yes. Here's how one Here's how one uh, writer puts it. Light is necessary for the survival of life on earth as almost all energy used by life is derived from the sun. That's with a U, though it could be with an O. Plants and algae use light energy in photosynthesis, which provides usable chemical energy for heterotrophic organisms. Heterotrophic is a word I had to look up, had no idea what that meant. It refers to the fact that there are creatures, which is to say most of them on earth, who receive their sustenance from something outside of themselves. Apparently there are such things as autotrophic organisms who receive their or their uh, nutrition internally. I have no idea how that works. It's completely irrelevant. If you want to look it up this afternoon, feel free. But the point is that life on earth is indeed dependent upon light. Life on earth is a hierarchy. At the base of that hierarchy uh, are one-celled organisms and plants. And above them are the animals that eat plants. And above them, animals that eat not only plants, but other animals. And the way we usually picture such things is in terms of, of the, the, the development of animals from plant, or development of life from, uh, from plants uh, to, uh, to invertebrate animals, to vertebrate animals, uh, uh, you go up from fish to amphibians to reptiles to birds and and then to mammals. And finally, humanity sits on the top of that. Well, 
here's the point. Virtually all of those organisms are dependent on light because what's at the base of the hierarchy can't survive without light. Photosynthesis is based on the reception of light energy from the sun. And so it is true, unquestionably, that the light that came into the world at Christmas through the incarnation of the sun, that light was the life of men, even as it is the life of all of Earth's organisms. Light is a common theme, not just in John, uh, but throughout both the Old and New Testaments. And one of the passages that is best known in association with this theme of light and connected to the epiphany, the coming of the wise men to, uh, to see Jesus, is Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. We're going to take a look at those this morning. We'll begin this way. Let me note this. This passage is a prophecy. It is not a description of then current events. Isaiah is usually dated as having, uh, having written in the uh, 8th century, B no, 7th century BC, pardon me, uh, in the 700s BC. And when he says, arise, shine, for your light has come, He's speaking of the future. He's not speaking of life in either of the divided kingdom at that point. Neither Israel nor Judah was the source of that light or receptive of that light. In fact, what might be a better way to, uh, to put this is one translation that I came upon this week, which is arise, shine, for your light comes, which suggests the future. Well, the fact is, this isn't just a prophecy in general. This is a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. Church has always read that this passage that way. For instance, the third century writer Methodius, uh, a bishop of Greece, uh, wrote, Hail and shine thou Jerusalem, for thy light is come, the light eternal, the light forever enduring, Christ our very God. That's just one of countless examples of how this has been read, not as a description of 7th century Israel, but as a description of a time in what for Isaiah was the unknown future when the Messiah would actually come into the world. The prophecy itself is of a light that will illumine not only Israel, however, but will in fact illumine the whole world. The light is from God, and the light is God. Again, I refer to the, uh, to the uh, prologue of John's gospel, where, uh, where the apostle writes that, um, that uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And that's exactly what Isaiah was referring to. In these first three verses, he first uh, mentions the light, and he equates that light with the glory of God, the light, the glory of the Lord. I'm sorry, the, the, the light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That's an example of parallelism. These things are said in slightly different ways, but in fact are referring to the same thing. The very glory of God has come among them and it's described as light. Again, the connection with John is, uh, is, is, uh, is pretty obvious. Then in verse 2, in verse 2, he offers a contrast to what he talks about in verse 1. And this, again, refer, uh, John referred to this and uh, connected to it uh, when he referred to the light not being overcome by the darkness. Because sadly, sadly, 
the world into which the Messiah would come was a dark one. It was a dark world. Behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. The darkness is sin. Darkness is the bondage of Satan. Darkness is the rule of death and the hold that death has over us. Uh, for, for Christians, that hold has been loosened, but for the world, the world sees, still sees the end of physical life as being, uh, as, as being a, a horrendous tragedy, which is, which is always to be, to be mourned, always to be grieved, always to be prevented if possible. Well, at least part of the world still sees it that way. Uh, not all of it, but uh, that's an issue for a different time. This darkness is said to cover the peoples and cover the earth. It's a darkness that doesn't permit light to come in. It's a darkness that uh, is, is summed up in the word rejection might also be summed up in the word rebellion. Basically, the people of the world have put out the lights. They've decided they'd rather live in the dark. Uh, they like it in the dark, you know? Um, there are a lot of people who, who prefer the dark to the light, who think that in the darkness, they can get away with more. Who think that in the darkness, they can, they can indulge their 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 wildest thoughts. They can indulge their basest desires and no one will see them. You know, why, why, do, why do criminals operate primarily after dark, after, after the sun goes down? It's easier to get away with it that way. You know, it's as simple as that. Darkness is preferred by, by significant portions of, of the human population simply, simply because they think that it provides cover for them. And they like, they like that cover. And darkness, Isaiah says, shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. And he doesn't, he doesn't exempt anyone here. No one in, in his conception of this time of the Messiah's coming in, no one is exempt from this darkness. This darkness is, is universal. This darkness is all encompassing. And this darkness will retreat like a cockroach under a rock with the coming of the light. The Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. The light will come into the world, he says, through God's people, through Israel. And this, of course, is the promise that he had made all along. It's a promise that goes back to Abraham, where he promised that the nations of the world would be blessed through Abraham and through his descendants. It's a promise that he repeated over and over again, in the Old Testament, most prominently in the book of Isaiah, where, where the prophet makes absolutely clear that the concern of the Lord is that, is that uh, his people not think of themselves simply as, as, uh, as one among many, nor that they think of themselves as somehow superior to others. Rather, they are a chosen vessel, and it is through them that the world would be blessed. The glory of God would be evident in Israel. And that's why the Magi came. The Magi were not country bumpkins, as it were. The Magi were among the most educated of the leadership of uh, ancient Persia. Uh, we don't know exactly what they were. We do know that the English language has taken their name for the word magician, but the chances are that they were not magicians. In fact, uh, 
to the extent that they have anything to do with, with the occult at all, uh, it would be because they probably uh, practiced um, uh, astrology. Yes, thank you. All I could come up with was horoscope. That's, <laughs> that's the result of astrology. That's not the practice. Okay. They were astrologers, but they were also, no doubt, astronomers, not nearly as sophisticated as we would know today, but astronomers, men who, who uh, observed the heavens, observed the movement of bodies, and uh, actually knew a lot more than we probably think that they did. They did. Um, uh, they were, for their time, most likely well-read. In fact, these, however many there were, the three is based on the gifts, not based on how many came. But however many came, they were certainly, certainly uh, familiar with the Hebrew scriptures, uh, which had been taken to Persia centuries before, during the Babylonian captivity and after that. And, uh, and so they knew of the promised Messiah, whom they referred to as the king of the Jews. And they came all the way from, from modern Iran, uh, hundreds of miles uh, across desert, not knowing exactly where they were going, except to the extent that they were, were seen to be following the directions of a star. And uh, they came to this backwater province in the Roman Empire, so they're foreigners on top of everything else. And they come, they say, to worship him. Now, you might think, well, they weren't Jews. They didn't care who they worship. They were Zoroastrians. Zoroastrians are monotheistic people. They're not pagans. They're not, they're not polytheists. They don't worship trees and bushes and snakes and cats, etc. They're monotheists. They conceive of God in many ways, not all, but in many ways that are similar to the way that Jews and Christians do. And so when they say they have come to worship him, that's not just the throw off, well, you know, we'll worship anything. They've come specifically because they know there is something extraordinary about this child that has been born. No doubt they are familiar with, with the Old Testament prophecies and they recognize that there is something about this child that is divine, that in some way or another, he is far, far beyond uh, a prophet or a teacher or anything like that. Well, in the midst of this darkness, there are those who would see the wise men were the first Gentiles who saw that. But as it turned out, as this light grew in the world, as it took form, as it shone forth, not just from Bethlehem, but from Nazareth, from Capernaum, uh, from Sidon and Tyre, from, uh, from uh, Jerusalem and, uh, and points south, uh, this light, as it grew, would come to illumine the whole world, the whole world. And so the wise men were only the first, the first from outside of Israel to come to this inbreaking light. Verses four through six uh, describe uh, what's going to happen. The people of the world are going to come to Israel not necessarily to the specific spot, okay? Don't take the geographical references here as, as being necessarily literal, though, though uh, Isaiah would have meant them that way to begin with. Uh, they're going to come and they're going to bring their offerings to this Messiah of Israel this Christ, this Savior, they are going to bring their offerings and they're going to recognize him for who he is. And in verse six, we have two of the three elements that are mentioned in the story of the wise men, gold and frankincense, gold being associated with kingship, 
frankincense being associated with divinity, with religion. To this day, to this day, or Eastern Orthodox churches use frankincense in their in their uh, their worship services. Um, if you all ever want to get really really crazy and get people people and Anna talking, we'll we'll burn some uh, frankincense in here uh, during a worship service sometime. Those two elements are joined then by the wise men with myrrh, and myrrh course is associated with death. It was a spice that was used to prepare bodies for burial. And we all know in that story of the wise men is foreshadowed Jesus's end because the light that would come into the world is a light that the world would seek to extinguish. The light, <laughs> the light convicted the world. The light shone on the, on, the, on the dark places of the world and sent the cockroaches scattering. And they couldn't have that now, could they? And so the, the, light, the world would seek to extinguish the light, thought that was what was happening on Calvary. And the wise men didn't go any farther than that, but they might have. I guess they couldn't come up with something that would be associated with resurrection. But of course, that's where the story ended. And at that point, the light that shone forth really did completely overcome the darkness to the point where while, yes, there still is sin, there still is death, Satan still, still uh, uh, meddles in human affairs, it is the case that the hold of darkness over us and over humanity as a whole has been broken. Sadly, there are still people who love the darkness and want to retain their place in the darkness, want to keep that covering over themselves. But for those who have seen that light and gone to it and received it, well, it is those upon whom the glory of the Lord has risen. Is light necessary for life? Absolutely. And not just, not just because of photosynthesis. The light that was given through Jesus is a light that shines out from every one of his people. And there are no dark places where we are now. Even if these electric lights burned out, there'd still be light here. It would be shining out from each of us. It would be on our faces. It would be on our lips. It would be in our hearts and minds. And anyone who came into this place would be able to see they might then walk out because they think, I don't want to mess with that. But they'd be able to see because the light has come and the light is alive and the light is in and shining through us. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have conquered the darkness, even as it continues to scurry about in the world, pretending that it has a future, we know that, uh, that it has no power over your people. We thank you for that. And we ask that as we go forth this morning into the world, that your light would shine out through us that when people see us, they might see your son, not because we're wonderful people, but because he lives in us and works and can be seen through us. Father, we ask that for the sake of all those whom we meet who are still living in darkness and in the name of your son. Amen.
please stand as you're able and join us for our closing hymn, number 114, As With Gladness, Men of Old. <laughs> And now as you depart, receive this benediction from the Lord. May the God of all grace, who has sent his light into the world and into us, that the world might be saved by it, go with us, go with you, and uh, be seen in you and work through you, both now and forever. Amen. Amen.